follow along. And I did send everybody a PDF of the slideshow that Dr. Kempler is going to be using. Um, so do not be afraid to ask questions. The, the, the big topics that I, I want you guys to ask Dr. Kempler today, specifically discussing airway care. What, how do you make those decisions? How do you make the decisions of, all right, we're going to upgrade, or I need to start considering calling for orders to maybe take this patient's airway the best that I can in our region with some light sedation and maybe just you know taking it versus I can maintain with a CPAP. Does that make sense? So how do you make those clinical decisions immediately, right? Because that's, that's, that's the big concern. And also, emergency patients in general. I want you to ask Dr. Kempler about his decision-making process on emergency care. So how, do you, how does he approach the patient in reference to patient assessment? Because I can guarantee you it's very similar to what we're teaching you with the LOC, ABC, controlling bleeding prior to any of that. So how does he make his approach to the patient, his visual size up, and then his actual patient assessment of the primary symptoms, and then making his differential diagnoses from there, right? And then choosing which path to go down. So ask him questions about that. And uh, so before we get started, I do want to discuss OR. Um, today we're going to be tubing a lot. We're going to have simulation center time this afternoon. I'll break the class up into two major groups. Half of you will stay with me and we'll start cardiology. The other half will go into the innovation lab or to the sim lab and we'll do innovations. We also have a mannequin set up in the lab area. Throughout the day, everybody go in there and practice. I'm going to leave him set up. Just know ahead of time, he is a difficult intubation. And one thing that Dr. Kipler can tell you about is the actual, the the pliability of the tissues, of real human tissue. Unfortunately, it's very hard to find a mannequin that actually expresses the, the give of, epi, of epithelial tissue and mucosal membranes. It's really hard to find a mannequin that will actually mimic that. So keep that in mind, he, the tube is difficult to pass through there, but I want you guys going in there and going through the motions of using the scissor technique. First off, sizing up his airway. On a normal human, he'd be a, the easiest innovation ever, but just the fact that he's plastic and it kind of narrows down like a pediatric airway for some reason. But sizing up his airway, then using scissor technique, insertion of the blade while sweeping the tongue, and then again, using that 45 degree pushing up, not tilting back, right? We don't want to break any teeth. His teeth are already broken. He looks like he's from Habersham County. Um, I'm from Habersham County. I'm making it myself. I grew up in Habersham. So he looks like my brother. Um, he ain't kidding. He's my brother. Good old fire service saying, right? So you're going towards that angle so that you can visualize the airway. That's what I want you to focus on is going through that and thinking about how you know, all right, if I actually want to innovate this mannequin, I have to cork him up off the table. You can't do that to a human patient, right? You will destroy tissue, you will cause damage. So think about just the overall process and also think about proper BBM technique because that is one of the major things that you need to learn in the OR is actually how difficult it is to truly bag effectively. More of pulling pulling the jaw into the mask as opposed to shoving the mask onto the face, right? The actual proper bagging technique is difficult and your hand will be sore after a while. Um, so thinking about those principles as well. So, but it's gonna be an awesome day. I'm gonna shut up and I'm gonna let Dr. Kempler introduce himself.
measure of a time, it will spread from the center. And the neighboring counties will look at their neighbors and say, they have a joint budget board. Why can't we have a joint budget board? And that's exactly what happened. And we've seen paramedics that were so fine that they went into the hospital or union and town county, and they would run the coast. You know, the doctors would step aside, and our, and our paramedics would run the coast. And that may still be that way. I wouldn't be surprised because you guys will be the cutting edge. <laughs> now, um, I guess we'll get out of political medicine now that we've had a, a long introduction. Uh, let me let me start out with one piece of the budget on this debate because my life is not really on this debate. You know, I, I used to love to influence, and I prided myself at, at being successful the majority of the time. I've only had to do a couple of strikes in my life, and they're dramatic, but usually unnecessary. It's just uh, and I'll tell you about those strikes. The one went, went so fast that my instructor turned his back what was done before, <laughs> before he turned around. And the second one was a blunt trauma to the neck, and you don't ever want to do that if you can help it because it was a cut down to a bloody, soggy, can't find the airway mess. So beware of blunt trauma. The landmarks are not easily discernible. But I, I used to just put the silk in, lift it up, and see where I was. And that was effective, but I learned a better way. And, and the way that, that I do it now, or used to do it, is as soon as you put the blade into the mouth, look your way down the tongue. Okay, so instead of just but if you, if you stick it in and pick it up, sometimes it went too far, sometimes it went far enough, and you don't know where you are, so you got to manipulate it back and forth. But if you look your way down the tongue from the beginning, the epiglottis will <coughs> quickly pop into space. I always like to use a three curve blade, uh, which, uh, which uh, surprises me some because manually forcing the epiglottis out of the way would be more my style, <laughs> but finessing it out of the way with the curved blade that goes into the molecular always works better for me. Uh, so whichever one you use, look your way down the tongue. You'll never be in too far that way. You'll never wonder where you are that way. And when the epiglottis pops into sight, if you're using the curved blade, you just slide into the molecular. And if you're using the straight blade, just go over the top of the epiglottis. The other point is, Brandon was talking about 45 degrees. Think about it of, of pulling it in the direction of the handle. You know, so when you're putting it in, the handle is naturally going to be at 45 degrees. So pull it in the direction of the handle when you're pulling, and that way you're not cranking it back or leveraging speed. Okay, so now my favorite airway story. Uh, <laughs> I had the occasion to see a, about a one-year-old child that developed a sudden strider mm. while she was playing on the floor. And she was moving air, and she had a heartbeat, and, and she was irritable, obviously. Um, so we, we put her in the trauma room, and, and I took my laryngoscope and laid her down, held her down. She's not sedate her because when someone has a tenuous airway, they need all of the oomph that they can muster to move their tubule. Mm. 
you know, I didn't really suspect that this was epiglottis either because there was no fever and the sudden onset and the hips of the swelling. If I had suspected epiglottitis, you don't ever want to do anything for that airway. You don't look at it with a tongue blade, you don't stick your scope in there, unless you're a rat thing, and then you have to, but you can make epiglottitis worse in a hurry. Uh, and, and I used to call for an anesthesiologist, and those are cases that I wouldn't even try and intubate in the ER if I could have the drug. But at any rate, this, this was not my suspicion. I laid her down, I took a look at the scope, and what did I see? She had inhaled a spool of thread mm. that fortunately someone had taken the paper off of the two ends or punctured it where the bobbin spindle goes through there, and she was breathing through the hole in the center of the spool of thread. And fortunately, somebody had taken the paper off because if that paper had been on, she would have been dead. Uh, and with my handy medial forceps, you know, she had gotten the, the, half, the first, you know how it's bigger <coughs> on the two ends of the spool? She had gotten the first big end through, but the second big end didn't get through. So with the medial forceps, it came right out, and she was happily in life. So let's see what you did. Now I'm not much for slides usually, as you can probably tell, I'm more of a freehand lecturer. Uh, so this is you know, enough. It's enough. Like that, you have to apply 
positive pressure ventilation or stabilize the flow of segment or something to, to recover the, the panic that the ventilation um, If there's a problem with your brain, your medulla has the respiratory segment and that's what tells your body to breathe. You don't have to think about it. In fact, if you think about it, it'll drive you crazy. <laughs> you know? So you, you breathe naturally. You breathe when you're asleep. Uh, there's a, a Greek myth about Ondine's curse that uh, some guy did something and the guy cursed him that as soon as he fell asleep, he would stop breathing. And so he stayed up for days until he could no longer stay up, and then he fell asleep and died because he had taken away his respiratory drive. So all of these are different things. Chain soaks is periodic breathing, uh, too small to deep breathing, uh, center, central neurogenic hyperventilation. Actually, that would make you hyperventilate. Uh, and ataxic and uh, apneusic is what you see in someone that's arrested and they take those fish free fish breath, that's that new facility. All right, problems in diffusion. This is mostly COPD and there are various granulomatous diseases like Wegener's granulomatosis and sarcoidosis and uh, you know, metastatic cancers that can uh, alter the, the, the diffusion uh, problem. But COPD is by far the most common disruptor that you'll see. That and things like heart failure, pulmonary edema, you'll see a good bit of that too. All right, uh, the permeability is mostly things like shock lungs uh, or ARDS where people are sick from sepsis uh, and there's a damage to the capillary and the helium that causes leaky capillaries that causes fluid in the spaces. Fluid interferes with the exchange of, of gases and, and so that's a problem with, with diffusion. All right. Um, Just ask about the area. Sir, you have a question for you about uh, yeah. ARDS. Yeah. Uh, one of the paramedics in Hong Kong, his wife, hospitalized, long story short, she got diagnosed with a horrible case of ARDS. And what ultimately was the solution, and it was kind of their last ditch treatment plan, they proned her. They put her in a prone position, yes. and she made a drastic improvement. Why is, why is this orientation that? Well, that's, you know, the, the fluid is gonna drain to the lowest space. You know, so I guess they were clearing the, the back side of the lung, you know, the, the lungs are kind of a wedge shape where they're smaller in the front than they are in the back. So my guess is that they were mobilizing the fluid away from the bigger volume of lung. You know, they use ECMO a lot in, uh, in ARDS now. It's, <coughs> we used to use that in prematures when I was in town, but now it's available for adults. You know what ECMO is? That's the corporeal membrane oxygenation where basically have an artificial lung that is oxygenated. Feel free to ask any questions. I love questions. We can go anywhere you want. <laughs> All right. Uh, reduction in hemoglobin will affect the fusion. Hemoglobin is prepared to oxygen. Liquid blood without hemoglobin is like having water in the blood. So that's, that's why when you're filled with suffering, of the lung and go, it's like having a right to left shot in your heart or a, a 
like a BSD. Well, a BSD is your left brain. The, the blood bypasses the oxygen exchange mechanism, so you end up with desaturated blood on the arterial side. So that affects the level of oxygen in the blood, and that affects the, the level of oxygen at the tissue level. The other area you can get pulmonary shunting is with a pulmonary embolus, where a clot knocks off the circulation to a part of the lung, but, but the, the breathing mechanism is still delivering oxygen to that unperfused section of lung. So no oxygen exchange is happening at that level either. <coughs> Okay, always is the scene safe. You know, you don't want to become a victim. You won't, you, you won't be able to hear that too many times. If, if you're dealing with um, a fire, cyanide gas, carbon monoxide, chlorine gas, ammonia gas, don't become a victim. You, you're gonna need uh, a hazmat response. You're gonna need uh, oxygen breathing devices so that you don't become a victim. Uh, look for visual clues, and as I said, there are certain things that are, are a risk to you. Um, all right, a closed space, active fire, we talked about that. And we talked about that. All right, you all know what the tripod position is? Yes. All right, well, that's when someone is like this. They'll they'll do to their airway what you would normally do to open someone's airway. They extend their neck, head is forward, chin lift, jaw thrust, and they use their arms to elevate their collarbones to try and increase the volume of their chest. Uh, and that's a sign of severe respiratory distress. And you can see that in asthmatics or chronic lungers. Uh, they may be pale, they may be diaphoretic, uh, cyanosis is late, you may even not see cyanosis. There's a tripod. The mental status is uh, a valuable but late sign. Things are pretty bad by the time your brain is not getting enough oxygen. You know, and that's going to push you into more rapid activity than if someone is able to give you three or four sentences in between breaths. All right, so um, restlessness and agitation comes early. Uh, confusion means they're hypoxic and hypercarbic. And if they're somnolent or have mental status changes, <clears throat> prepare to take over. Okay, the ability to speak is very valuable. If they can speak in full sentences, you've got some time. If it's one word in between each breath, things are getting pretty critical. Okay, and you've, you've probably all heard that you don't want to give oxygen or too much oxygen to someone with chronic lung disease. My philosophy was different, but I already told you I love to intubate. <laughs> so in my view, the proper treatment for someone that's hypoxic is give them oxygen. They need oxygen. If it causes them to stop breathing, I like to intubate anyway, you know? <laughs> and I like to use a bag belt mask. So problem is twofold. One is they're not getting enough oxygen, you got to give it to them, and if that makes them stop breathing, <clears throat> then you need to breathe for them. Why does oxygen make a lunger stop breathing? Hypoxic drive. Okay, so if I ask you all to hold your breath, the carbon dioxide would build up more quickly than the oxygen would fall, and you would get this irresistible urge to breathe. So carbon dioxide drive is what drives most normal human beings, all normal human beings to breathe. Because your brain is sensitive to levels of carbon dioxide. But in a chronic lunger, their carbon dioxide is always elevated. 
And so the body gets blunted to that. You know, it's like hearing the same noise all the time. You stop hearing it after a while. And so the body becomes desensitized to, to carbon dioxide drive. And so all that's left is hypoxic drive. And hypoxic drive <coughs> is numero uno uh, among humans. You know, that, <coughs> that will take over acid base, um, you know, the, the, the urge to provide oxygen at the tissue level is job one. So if, if you take away the hypoxic drive, there, there is no perceived reason for that person to breathe. I can tell you of a case when I was an intern at the VA hospital in Augusta where we had a chronic lunger that we, we found purple in his bed. He got short of breath and reached over and turned up his oxygen. And so he stopped having a reason to breathe. So he stopped breathing. And we managed to save him, but you can't put a, a lock on the oxygen knob. So we, we had to just warn him that he didn't need to do that or it was going to be a fatal mistake. But he breathed easier for a minute or two, I guess, before he stopped, breathing, before he lost consciousness. I have a question for you yes. regarding ventilating patients. Yes. Um, when you are sizing up a patient, what do you use to delineate between we're going to innovate this person or we're just going to put OPA in and ventilate them until we get to the hospital. Like what, are, what are some of the factors that you know, in, in, in your mind when you say, you know what, let's just put OPA and we'll ventilate until we get to the hospital versus I need to take this airway right now. That's a great question. You know, and the main advantage of an endotracheal tube is it protects the airway. So if I'm in a situation where there are, not, there are not a lot of secretions or bleeding or a reason that, or you know, emesis or, or some reason that I need to protect the airway, a bag valve mask is a great way to go. So like an overdose, for instance, but no real secretion, but just knocked out the respiratory drive? See, it, it depends on how deep the overdose is. You know, if they don't have an intact gag reflex, that is a disaster waiting to happen. You know, and I used to nasotracheally intubate a lot of people, um, but they've got to be breathing right. for you to do that. And and if they have no gag reflex, you better be good at it because you're going to be jerking around their gag reflex as you're trying to get this thing to go in. Um, the the problem with nasotracheal intubation is your body is made for stuff that gets into your mouth to go down your esophagus. I mean, you want it that way. When you eat lunch today, you want it that way. You don't want it where the preferred route is down your trachea and into your lungs. So the nasotracheal tube wants to go down the esophagus. And I used to fork it you know, to try and make it come around to the side to, to make it elevated, they make a really slick endotracheal tube that's got a ring on it. I guess you've seen those where you, you pull the ring and the tube flexes. That is a neat, neat thing because you want the tube to come anterior, but a nasotracheal intubation is done by sound. You know, you, you hear them breathing through the tube and you know you're in the right area. If you lose breath sound, you're going down the wrong road. So, you know, secretions or protection of an airway with, with an inadequate gag reflex are the two things that would force my hand. And, and it's, you know, it's the same way in the ER, um, for the most part, yeah, for the most part. I mean, if, if I'm worried that, that I'm gonna get into an aspiration situation, I'll go ahead and intubate her. Good questions. All right. Um, Retractions in kids is, is uh, a real sign of respiratory distress, and it's one of the most sensitive. Nasal flaring and intercostal retractions is what I use more in kids than in adults, but, uh, but if you see that in adults, it means they're working pretty hard. What that means is they're trying to generate so much intrathoracic negative pressure that it's sucking in 
the spaces between the ribs, and that's not normal. You don't normally retract in between your ribs. Nasal flaring, you see that in kids. Um, uh, use of accessory muscles, cyanosis, pursed lips. Um, what is pursed lips? What does that do? Okay, right, it's like CPAP. You know, so you're trying to keep the alveoli from collapsing by uh, moderating the negative pressure in the chest on exhalation. So that's what pursed lips are for. Uh, tracheal tugging, I can't say that that's ever been particularly uh, valuable to me. Um, and as always, you're going to do the ABCs first. All right, any, any abnormality that threatens the airway is potentially life-threatening. Um, we used to have a sign in the residency that said, noisy airway, noisy breathing is obstructed breathing. You know, so if, if, if they're making noise, there's a problem. Now, you may be able to fix that with a jaw thrust or a head tilt, or a, or a nasal trumpet, or whatever you need to do. You don't necessarily need to intubate them, but, uh, but your initial approach to an obstructed airway is an attempt to open the airway because that is job one. Well, scene safe is job one, but as far as the patient safety, the airway is job one. Um, the brain can only live for a few minutes. Four minutes is generally, uh, generally uh, bantered about. Um, artificial respiration is useless if the airway is blocked, and a patent airway is useless if the patient's not using it. So it takes open airway and breathing and circulation to make this body tick and continue to tick. All right, don't look for help, just act immediately. That's jaw thrust, chin lift. Got to open the airway, that is it. All right, once you've secured the airway, then you make sure that they're ventilating. Brief and direct, this cannot take much time. Um, we have talked about most of this. I mean, if, if, if they're not moving air, you're going to quickly figure out that they're not moving air. If they're, if they're stridorous, uh, that is an uh, impending problem. Um, if they're tachycardic, that's a problem. If there's alteration of mental status, we talked about all that. All right. Um, retractions, we've talked about. Accessory muscles, we've talked about. Resuscitate. These slides get kind of re redundant. I'm sorry about that, but they're not, they're not mine. All right, secondary assessment. Uh, you all know what a sample history in the OPQR is? Good, then I will go through that. Uh, past history, past history is critical. You know, if, if you get to someone's house and they're short of breath, you know, two questions can get you home. You know, have, do, they have, do they have COPD? Uh, have they had heart failure? Have they had fevers? They have a history of anything? Yeah, he gets pneumonia once a month. You know, he's got it again. You don't have to be Einstein to figure it out. You're not going to see a COPD or and make the primary diagnosis. I don't believe. I don't. I don't know if I've ever done that. You know, but you're not going to get called to someone's house that has new onset COPD. It doesn't happen that way. So find out what they had, and they probably have it again. Now don't, don't get sucked into it. You know, it can always be a ringer, but that, that's a big clue. Uh, if they've been previously intubated, watch your back. You know, it can happen again. And, if, you know, if someone's been intubated, they, they have a higher likelihood of being intubated again, maybe by you. See if they have a known respiratory disease. Determine if it's a ventilation diffusion or perfusion problem uh, and see what their medications are. You know, if they're on provental and steroids, that's a clue. You know, they're being treated for COPD. You know it. <coughs> All right, particular attention to meds that uh, suggest pulmonary disease. If they have a home nebulizer or home oxygen, these are obvious clues, you know, obvious what's going on. Drugs for cardiac conditions, always ask about allergies because you don't want to make things worse. All right, uh, 
look for signs of swelling or infection, if they've had a lot of sputum, or if they've had fevers, look for uh, jugular vein, look for fetal edema. You know, that's, to me, more helpful than jugular veins, although I look at jugular veins. Um, if they have fetal edema, that's, you know, they, they probably got heart failure as a part, if not all. Now, they can have COPD and congestive heart failure, but fetal edema or, or jugular vein distension are, are clues to, to failure. All right, uh, the standard steps, inspection, palpation, percussion, <laughs> palpation. COPDers have increased AP diameter of their chest for reasons that we'll talk about in a bit, but they have air trapping and they have more of a barrel chest, so that's that's a clue that, that, that they are COPDers. Um, palpate, you're going to find the more of the traumatic things or sub-Q emphysema. I, I can't tell you how many times I've diagnosed pneumothoraces by putting my hands on the chest and feeling the sub-Q air, um, where it's it's tough to hear if it's small, but uh, but you can you can feel it if if you just touch the patient, you know. I, I've seen doctors that try and <clears throat> diagnose people without putting their hands on them, and I don't know how they do it. I don't think they do. But, and, and the same goes for you in the field. You you got to touch them. If, if, if you're going to diagnose hypothermia, you know, I've had cases where the patient is 85 degrees, and I put my hands on them, and they're ice cold, and, and the paramedic didn't get it because you know, they didn't touch them. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Dr. Right. Yeah. So, well, you're about to talk, talk about it more than likely, but what uh, what are your thoughts on the applicability of percussion and how it's done in EMS field? Percussion is not particularly helpful. You know, I mean, unless it comes from a doctor, <laughs> it, it, it's not helpful as a doctor. You know, um, I would say in the days before we had X ray percussion was probably more important because you can percuss out a pleural effusion. Uh, you might be able to percuss out a pneumothorax, but there are better ways. And you're in a noisy environment. You know, listening to breath sounds is marginally helpful to you in the field. We're being realistic now. I mean, if you, if you want to follow the slides, you do your inspection, palpation, percussion, all percussion. If you want to get real, you're going to listen to the breath sounds. I would listen posterior basally to see if there are rowels because that's how I'm going to diagnose failure. I'm going to listen a couple places anteriorly to see if I can hear wheezes that are going to get me towards asthma or COPD. And I'm going to make sure they're moving air and I'm pretty much done with the respiratory system. I wouldn't waste a lot of time percussing, and, you know, and I'd palpate. I always put my hands on them and feel for the integrity of the chest wall, especially in trauma, because that's going to affect something that I need to do in the field. But for you to know if the pleural effusion goes a third of the way up or half of the way up by percussion is a waste of your time. Good. All right. Um, and limit percussion to suspected case of pneumo or pulmonary edema. And you can skip it for pulmonary edema if you just listen. Uh, and, and what are you going to hear if there's a pleural effusion? You might hear a pleural rub, not usually. You're not going to hear anything because it's underwater. <laughs> Think about it. Okay, let's say that there's fluid halfway up the lungs on the left side. And you put a stethoscope there, it's like listening to breath sounds over the liver. <laughs> there's, there's no air there. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if, if you have an absence of breath sounds, it's either fluid or a pneumo. And if you want to percuss it to try and figure it out, the, the pleural effusion would be dull or flat, and the pneumo would be like a drum, but 
I would look for pos signs of positive pressure in the chest before I wasted a lot of time for cussing. You know, if there's a lot of respiratory distress, tracheal deviation, distended neck veins, this is just uh, making you suspect positive pressure in the chest. So, so those might be might be a reason to percuss, but uh, in general, not. <laughs> I don't percuss that much in the ER. That's just not that helpful, especially if you're going to get a chest X-ray and tell you exactly what's in there in ten minutes. And it isn't going to change what you do from an ABC standpoint. You know, if they're in, if they're hypoxic, you're going to give them oxygen. If they're not breathing, you're going to breathe for them. It doesn't really matter unless it's a tension pneumo and you're trying to decide if there's positive pressure in the chest, which is the way that they just returned. All right. Take that out of the they do? Yeah. All right. Inspection of the chest. Secondary gate breath sounds. Um, I didn't find these slides very helpful. You know, once again, I told you what I listen for and what I want to hear. I want to hear that they're moving air. I want to hear if there's wheezes anteriorly. I want to hear if there's crackles posteriorly or anywhere else. I mean, if you hear crackles in the right middle lobe and they have a fever, I've told 100 patients before their x-ray they have a right middle lobe pneumonia and I would delight when the chest x-ray came back and proved that positive. <laughs> By the way, I don't know what kind of stethoscopes you guys had. When, when I was, um, when I was in first year medical school, they gave us a stethoscope, and I was so proud. But but it was a piece of trash, you know. And you know, and I, as I as I went through my clinical years, um, the my instructors would say, "You can't hear that. No, you can hear it with this junky stethoscope. You need a de decent stethoscope." And the stethoscope, which which I ended up using for for the majority of my clear my career, is called a Littman cardioscope. It's about a hundred bucks. You know, it'll last you for your lifetime. The 3M company that makes it will repair it free of charge for life, and it makes a difference what you're listening with. You know, you cannot hear. The, the finer aspects of breath sounds with a twenty nine ninety nine stethoscope. You can, and, and I don't I don't get kickbacks from Littman, but that's the scope I used, and it worked great. And I could diagnose pneumonias without a chest X ray. And so I, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what kind of scopes you use, but that's just a by, by the side. Uh, okay. Abnormal breath sounds, uh, snoring, obstructed airway, strider, pending obstruction of the airway, wheezing, bronchi, COPD, rouse, pneumonia or heart failure, uh, pleural friction rub, this is what you were talking about, the, the lining of the lung looks like cellophane and there's a, a lining of cellophane on the inside of the chest wall and a lining of cellophane on the outside of the lung. And the two are applied to each other and there's a vacuum in that space. And the two layers slide frictionlessly against each other when the lungs move with every breath. If there's uh, anything that goes on inflammatory wise, uh, pneumonia can do it, pleurisy can do it, you know, pleurisy is an inflammation of the pleura, which are these cellophane-like linings. And that causes uh, roughness to the layers, and so you hear kind of a crunching sound with every breath. And that's the, the pleural friction rub, and it, it uh, signifies that there's an inflammatory response between the two layers of the pleura. All right, secondary assessment. We talked about looking for edema, uh, looking for cords like a, like a pulmonary embolus. Uh, you know, pulmonary embolus is like the, I think the fifth most common cause of sudden death. And 
the slide says you can fill a court in 50% of the cases. I, I think that's probably optimistic. Um, I don't know if I've ever diagnosed a pulmonary embolus by virtue of feeling a cord in the legs, but that's just me. Uh, look for peripheral cyanosis, which is a sign of hypoxia. Clubbing of the fingers is a chronic lung uh, finding. Um, I haven't found that particularly helpful. What happens is that the, I think there's a picture of that. Yeah, that's a, see, they say the normal finger looks like this. Now, I don't know how they get these angles because it looks like the left-hand side of that angle is sticking up in the air. <laughs> anyway, clubbing is where the end of the finger looks more like a club. I haven't found this to be particularly helpful, and I trained at the VA hospital where smokers would hold their cigarettes up to the port on the ventilator so they could continue to smoke while they were intubated. So um, that's a viper. You gotta want it to put it up against the ventilator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that, but I think it's probably chronic hypoxia at the, at the extremity level. That, that'd be my best guess. Now, why that causes it to club, I have no idea. Okay. All right, uh, secondary assessment, tachycardia may be hypoxia. Tachycardia can be a lot of things. It can be hypertension, it can be hypovolemia, it can be drugs, it could be hypoxia, it could be sepsis, it could be a million things, so nonspecific. Pulsus paradoxicus, what is pulsus paradoxicus? N equals Pulses in extremity? Not exactly. Mm -hmm. Is the blood pressure changes when they take a breath in? Yes. Opposed to the next breath? That's part of it. Okay. I think it's whenever, um, because of the preload and afterload, is when kind of like, uh, kind of like put the pressure <coughs> against, so the diastole and the systole is kind of like in the middle. So kind of Not exactly. All right. When the, you don't feel pulses or? That's very close. Yeah. Okay, here it is. Normally, when you inhale, there's a decrease of the systolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters. Pulsus paradoxus is where <coughs> the decrease in blood pressure is more than 10 millimeters. Okay, so how is that a paradox? That's not a paradox. So have they misnamed it? No, they haven't. The reason that there's a paradox is that if you're listening to the heart, you can hear a heartbeat, but you lose the pulse during inspiration. So the paradox is that you hear the beat, but you can't feel the beat because the pressure has dropped so much during inhalation that you lose the pulse. And positive pressure in the chest will do that, like a tension pneumo or pericardial tamponade, or severe COPD, where there's increased pressure in the chest, so there's decreased venous return during inspiration, so the blood pressure drops more than 10 millimeters during inspiration, <coughs> so you lose the peripheral pulse. Now, you gotta look for this, because how many times are you listening to the heart while you're feeling of the pulse? Never, never. So. The way that you traditionally would diagnose this is you'd be taking the blood pressure and the blood pressure will come and go, you know, as you deflate the cuff to the point that you're picking up the systolic pressure. When they inhale, you'll lose that, that beat. Okay? So you know what pulse is paradox is. Here. And what the, because it never made sense to me that it's not a paradox, it's, an exacerbation of a normal phenomenon. You know, a paradox would be if the blood pressure went up during inspiration instead of down. But the paradox is, is the, that's what I said. All right. Did you, uh, that occurred, did you find that that occurred some, with a relative amount of frequency with COPD patients, or is that just a, an abnormal finding that you occasionally see? Was that something that you could look at a COPD patient and say, eh, I, I'm, I'm probably going to? Notice this in the patient? No. No. Okay. In fact, I would rarely look for it because, as I said, I had more effective ways of making a diagnosis 
than a, than a protracted clinical exam, especially in the ER. You know, it was hit and run. You know, get this one started, order what you need to figure it out, move to the next one. You didn't spend a lot of time with wasted motion, and you probably shouldn't either. Because there's another patient waiting for you after you deliver this one. <laughs> All right, uh, elevated respiratory rate, um, a persistent slow rate. Um, I don't know if they're talking about the heart or the lungs, but either one would be ominous. You know, if you have bradycardia in the face of hypoxia, things are going very badly because the body does not compensate for uh, hypoxia with bradycardia except as a preterminal event. And, and in uh, infants and kids, that's ominous. You know, when you're like when you're looking at the, the prenatal decelerations, if they get bradycardic during a contraction, it stays. That's called a deceleration, and that'll get you a C-section in a hurry. So the body doesn't usually get bradycardic under stress, any stress. All right, continually reassess the rate and pattern. Uh, tachypnea is rated as more than 20. Bradypnea is slower than 12. Uh, pulse ox is great. I mean, I, I, I use pulse ox all the time to figure out how deep a ditch I was in. Um, if someone comes in or you get to someone and, uh, and I'd use 90 as my cutoff. If they're less than 90, they need O's. If that doesn't fix them, they need B's. <laughs> you understand what I mean? They need ventilators, okay? Because if you give someone enough oxygen and they don't spiff, they're not doing it on their own. And you know, you may not have to intubate them. You may need to just give them a few puffs with the bag. You may need to ensure the airways open. You may need to put them on a CPAP. And a C CPAP, you know, I have found to be a real blessing. I mean, I can't tell you how many patients with failure <coughs> that, that I used to have to intubate that I don't need to intubate anymore. Which is a shame, because I love to intubate. <laughs> I love to intubate. <laughs> but that, you know, that CPAP drives the fluid out of the lungs and my, my favorite patients to treat were uh, bad heart failure with pulmonary edema in a hypertensive patient. Because, let's, let's put it this way, if you're working with your buddy, it, and let's say he's working too, too hard and you want him to slow down, or he's working too slow and you want him to speed up, which is easier? Getting him to slow down is easier, right? Getting someone that's lazy and tired to work harder is tough. So uh, a hypertensive heart failure patient, you just need to reduce their workload and a little CPAP, little Lasix, little morphine, little nitro. In a half an hour, the attending would come down and say, this patient looks too good to be admitted. Well, you should have seen him a half an hour ago. Look at this chest x-ray. <laughs> And they say, yeah, okay. But you could tune them up in a hurry. You, you can have them better before they get to the hospital. But if they're hypotensive, that means the heart is tired and it needs whipping. And that's dangerous because pressures in the face of hypoxia um, can be very arrhythmogenic. And things can go from bad to worse in a hurry if you're not careful. So, but I diverge. Um, Dr. Kemp, we're on the note of the CPAP use. Um, <clears throat> your mind is founding on magnesium sulfate, um, on the use of mag in that severe respiratory <coughs> event and how that works. Yeah, I, I think magnesium is a, a smooth muscle relaxant. And so anything you can do to open the airways is helpful. Now, I used a lot of ProVental, a lot of bronchodilators, a lot of Atrovent, uh, early steroids. Magnesium has been shown to be very helpful, and you know, and it's safe, 
gosh, in, in, uh, in pre-eclamptic women, we used to give four grams IV stat. You're giving it a gram at a time, you know, so people can swallow a gram without a problem. I mean, IV swallow. <laughs> <laughs> IV pours. Um, now, in, in the higher doses, magnesium can have some untoward effects. Um, it can make you areflexic. And in fact, it does. We would see people, preeclamptics, that would lose their reflexes all the time. It can make you stop breathing altogether, which is bad, but liking to intubate the way we do, that's not a terminal problem as long as you stay on top of it and, and, and deal with it. Um, magnesium is also cardio stabilizing. You know, it, a lot of cases of uh, B-fib and B-tac will respond to magnesium. Torsad uh, will respond to magnesium. So uh, it's just another thing to keep in your armamentarium, but, but that's a good point. All right, um, love pulse oximetry. Um, finger or ear lobe, they, they make them now that will dis display how much hemoglobin because the old ones can't tell you if the hemoglobin is A. Normal hemoglobin is 12 to 14. Um, all it can tell you is the amount of saturated, the percent saturation of the hemoglobin that you have. So if you have a hemoglobin of eight and it's 100% saturated, your sat meter says 100%. But how are we doing at the tissue level? Not so good, you know, because only half of the oxygen carrying hemoglobin per unit time is passing this area that needs oxygen. There are new units that have, um, have the level of hemoglobin also. That's what it looks like. You all know what it looks like. Um, where he said that? Where he said that? All right, peak flow. Um, you know, in all honesty, peak flow is handy. I never was a big fan of it. it you know, we, we used to use it in asthmatics a lot. What that is is peak expiratory flow, flow rate. So you get something to breathe out forcefully and in obstructive lung disease. And now asthma is a reversible obstructive lung disease and emphysema and COPD are irreversible obstructive lung disease. But in an obstructive lung disease, there is um, resistance to exhalation so the peak flow is down. And you could predict whether someone would need to be admitted to the hospital based on their peak flow rate. Um, I always found that assessing a patient clinically, looking at them, assessing them for their work of breathing and looking at their oxygen sat was enough for me. I rarely would pull out the peak flow meter. Although the attendants loved it when I was in training, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste a lot of time with it if I were you. The, the thing above the tube and put the wall to a certain height? That's an incentive Usually they use that post-operatively, and what that does is it forces you to exhale to drive the balls up. <coughs> no, a peak flow, it's, um, it looks like a, a circular meter with a tube that you blow into. And you blow into it, and the arrow goes to a certain a certain level on the peak flow meter, and it tells how many liters per minute you're able to exhale. Okay? To be quite honest, I haven't seen them. I've never seen them on the ambulance with them. And we just do it out for yeah, it, they're, they're not, uh, you know. My philosophy with, with you guys is if it wasn't a proven value and it was a waste of time, you weren't going to get it. Okay. Yes? Um, back to innovation for a second. Yep. Uh, what should we or shall we do if we encounter like a Lorinda problem? That's a good question. You know, are you familiar with the Larson's notch or whatever, where the you apply pressure to the rear side of the head and it's supposed to stop it? 
No, but that sounds great to me. If you've got, <laughs> got anything that works. You know, what, what did the anesthesiologists used to use? They would spray lidocaine in there to try and break the spasm. You know, in my experience, laryngospasm will usually pass within a few seconds if you stop irritating it. You know, so typically you'll be trying to intubate someone and they'll spasm. If you just back off, maybe bag them for a, you know, a couple seconds or a minute, then try again, you can try again. But I'm not, I'm not aware of any drugs that you can give that are available to you. They use aerosolized lidocaine in the operating room, but I don't, I don't know. Anybody know of any, any drugs you can use for that? I don't But I've never been unable to intubate someone for any length of time due to laryngospasm. And I've intubated a lot of people. Because <laughs> I like to intubate, as you've heard. Hey, Dr. Kemper, on that note, um, what are your thoughts, and whenever you, people would call in for orders, potentially for this, on, say, just getting a little, just a little bit of edge and getting maybe one more gun reverse to 50 micrograms of fentanyl to be able to obtain the airway. What, what are your thoughts on that? Is that, is that overzealous? Is it a little dangerous? What you know, it's a little dangerous. You know, I understand it. You know, it, it, it depends on the situation. You know, I mean, if, if, well, there are two sides of it. You know, if someone is awake enough that you have to fight them to intubate them, they might not need to be intubated. You know, that's like we used to have a saying, if someone reaches up to stop you from doing CPR, they don't need CPR. You know, so if you, if you can't manage it with a bag valve mask and you're in a situation where you have to do it, but the patient's too awake that you that you can't intubate them without drugging them. I, I, that makes me nervous. I mean, I under, a burned airway. Or a, traumatic, a, traumatic burned, a burned airway, I could see it. I mean, that's a different situation where where you know laryngeal edema is a real a real foe, and it gets worse with time, and a definitive airway is going to be important. So would you feel like that's the that's the major cutoff between? You just need to have manage the airway otherwise, and then okay, if you have if you have an extreme amount of laryngeal edema, then you could, could potentially call for some assistance. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, not like a traumatic arrest scenario where they have too small breathing, and they're like they're decent. You know, they're still with it, but not really there at all. How how could they be with it with well, a traumatic arrest? We had a we had a, a head injury recently. Actually, my paramedic partner called for orders for that scenario and the, the doctor said no but he was too small he was breathing like uh, agony breathing and um we got to the hospital and i told him to be better and the trauma doctor at that hospital in particular said that that would have been an rsi scenario so i guess whoever he talked to said no and we're not allowed to do it anyways but um i don't know i just but the patient was awake i mean who's smiling while they were awake his eyes were open you know, they're not using that, that weight, I don't know. Yeah, to, 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 to my way of thinking, by the time you're coo smalling, there is pressure on your brain stem and you yeah. should not be awake and coo smalling. You know, his, his, the whole way there, his eyes are open, he's pretty much always. Well, really people small. have died with their eyes open. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that, but I'm just saying. I, 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 you know, I think that, you know, unless. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's a potential that things are going to be getting worse in a hurry and that time is of the essence, like a burned airway, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really not sure what I'd do with that one. You know, I, I, you know, sedating someone is a problem. In fact, I used to, I changed the way I would intubate people. You know, I used to use pavulon and succinylcholine all the time. And you damn well better get the airway if you do that because they're, they may have been breathing before you gave them depolarizing and non-depolarizing agents, but they're not after. And I didn't like the pressure of that, you know? And if you don't have to have that pressure, I moved over to Dipperman. And Dipperman works great. I mean, it killed Michael Jackson, 
<laughs> but, but I'm not standing over Michael Jackson watching his airway. And with, with Dipper Van, they lose consciousness, they lose their gag reflex, but they keep breathing. Well, it's easier to breathe, to tube someone when they're breathing. You just follow the air, you know, it, it's, it's great. And if it takes you two minutes to do it, they've been breathing the whole time. If you give them Pavilion and Sucks or Versed and it turns them off, clock is running, man. And I've been in situations where I could not get a tube in. They exist, you know, they exist for anesthesiologists. And you don't want to be there. If you can keep from being there, you don't want to be there. That's why I changed over to Dipperman. And, you know, once the tube got in, I'd pound them with pavulin and sucks. I don't care about that. I mean, I, I, I didn't want them to move for the next hour while I finished my x-ray. And, and I would do the breathing and that would be fine. But, you know, you, you, the, the Hippocratic Oath applies to you guys too. First, do no harm. So whatever you do, you got to make sure you're not going deeper into the hole before you do it. What's the John Ketamine? <laughs> See, we used to use ketamine a lot in the residency for reducing orthopedic things. Um, and I, I never liked it because, you know, you'd, like you'd have a kid and you'd have a radial fracture and you'd give them ketamine and you'd reduce it and they'd go, ow. They wouldn't move, they wouldn't cry, but they were dissociated, you know, so that their their body could still feel the pain, their brain just couldn't process it properly. And that always seemed to be kind of cruel to me that you're making them feel pain when they didn't have to feel pain, even if they couldn't process it. Um, now, ketamine has some new exciting stuff for depression. You know, there are ketamine clinics that are giving it IV and they're, they're having dramatic uh, effects on people that are acutely suicidal. In fact, I just heard within the last day or two that the FDA has approved a nasal spray ketamine that you don't even have to give IV, but it's got to be given in the doctor's office, so it's not gonna be for home use. Um, you know, I, I, would, I wouldn't prefer ketamine, although, it would have the advantage that it wouldn't stop them from breathing. Whether or not you get sedation that's deep enough is gonna be dose dependent. And you know, and it's gonna take a couple minutes to work. More if you give it IM, you can give it IV, but it's gonna take a couple minutes to work. It wouldn't be my first choice. <laughs> Dipper Van would be my first choice if, if I had a choice. Um, I always use the paralytics. I'm not familiar with Dipravan. What does that act on? How does that work? Uh, Dipravan is propofol. Um, we use it, 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 it's turned into a great emergency department drug. You know, when, when we used to relocate shoulders and hips and things like that, we would do it with an opiate and a benzo. And you'd have to give a boatload of drugs and you'd have to recover the patient for hours after you did it. It was just awful. And you know, Dipravan is uh, is an anesthesia anesthesia drug. It's what they give you when they're uh, when they're taking you down before they put the, the gases to you, the, the halothane or whatever they're going to use. Um, and so the onset is about thirty seconds, and the duration is less than five minutes. So. I can tell you a great story about this guy from New York that had a dislocated shoulder that, that I was going to reduce his shoulder. And, uh, and I'm giving him the Dipravan, and you give it slowly. And um, usually it takes about 100 milligrams, maybe 150 milligrams to put someone away. And, uh, and we'd have respiratory there watching their airway, although never had to intubate anybody on Dipravan usually keep breathing. Sometimes they desaturate. You got to puff them a few times with a bag valve mask. Um, so as this guy's going out, he says, uh, tell me, doc, has anybody ever 
fought this stuff off, and I said, give it your best shot, big boy, you know, as he rolled him up and, and went out. And we, we put the shoulder back in, and five minutes later, he's awake, and I said, congratulations, Mr. Smith, we put your shoulder back in. He said, you did not, you know. But it, it's a great drug, and it, it's in and out just like that. It would be great in the field. I mean, you know, it would be great. I, I don't, you guys don't carry it? They don't let you carry it? Yeah. See, we had to fight with the anesthesia department. Uh, you know, it was considered general anesthesia, and anesthesiologists are very turf protective. And so we, we had to, you know, and we used to do it just one dock. Now, you know, it's kind of like a one-arm paper hanger in a stiff breeze when you're the respiratory therapist <laughs> and, and, and given the, the drug and watching their airway and reducing the shoulder and, you know, so I really, you know, initially we had to have two doctors. One would administer the drug and the other one would administer the drug and watch the airway and the other one would perform the orthopedic maneuver. Um, then we moved to a respiratory therapist so we could do it with one doc so that the respiratory therapist would watch the airway. So that would be the main problem with you guys getting it is you'd have to fight the anesthesia department to have a, a, a general anesthetic on the, on the unit and you don't have enough hands to watch the airway while you're doing it. But if you were doing it, you'd be doing it for airway so you'd be in, in tune with the airway. Yes? We do not carry it on our truck but we take transfers out of our local hospital, yes. typically the Northeast Georgia. Yeah. And they usually put them on a different name. Yeah. yeah. And they wake up. They do not like a rough road. You have to turn it up on you, them coming down the road. If you, if you give them enough, they will not wake up. I promise. If you, if you, by the time you give them that much, it's usually about 55 miles transferred. You'll mm -hmm. run out between here and there. Usually we have to divert that about South Aberdeen. They need to give you more or increase the drip. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're managing the airway, there's no reason to not pound them with the Dipravan. You know, I mean, the, the problem with giving too much Dipravan is they stop breathing. But if you're doing a transport, I guarantee you they're intubated, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I would. See, when I, when I would transport people to Atlanta, I would just hit them with Pavulon and Sox. You know, Pavulon's good for an hour, and they're completely paralyzed. Well, I don't need anything from them. They might as well just <laughs> stay out. That's the way we feel about it, too, and we have to ask. They, sometimes they'll send birth and stuff with us because they won't let us put another bottle of Texas all up. Will they let you take Pavulon? First, that would be okay. You know, the, the problems with Versed is it suppresses respiration. Well, if you've already got the airway, that's not a problem. Um, you can also drop the blood pressure with Versed, which can be problematic. So, not 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 the greatest drug, but you know the wheels have changed, turned slowly. I mean, eventually, maybe you guys can get this in there. But that's as I said, that's that's what I changed to because I didn't have to stop him from breathing until I had to stop him from breathing. <laughs> yes. Uh, with the purple ball, have you noticed any differences in the metabolizing rate from juvenile to elderly? Um, not not so much, you know. But but I didn't really put a stopwatch on them. Um, what would change would be the amount it took to take them down because some people right. roll them up with 50 milligrams, and I've given 200, 250 milligrams, and there's no predicting. I mean, I'm, I, mean, I asked this, I worked at the ER in Robinson for a while, and we would knock kids out, and they would be like right back out of it, and they would constantly have to do something to pull them, and then you get some people, like you said, elderly, they, and the way they explained it to me was the metabolite <coughs> for the youth versus the older generations. That could be true. You know, I I just waited till they woke up. Whenever it happened, it happened, it, and it, it will happen. funny when they woke up, too. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, we talked about peak rate of, uh, in recorded liters per minute, but we're not doing that because you don't have it on your unit. Uh, capnography, um, you don't have that. Um, yeah, we do. do you? Oh, yeah. So now, and that's one thing that has been increased over the past couple of years as far as pre-hospital practice. The life packs, goals, they are having a rapid push for capnography um, and capnography as well. Uh, so especially for COPD patients, we have now have the capability to use the nasal um, capnography devices and take them up where you can actually see the efficacy of the treatment. That's great. You know, it's awesome. 
That's good. CO2 at 60, and then halfway down the road, it's down to 50, and keep going, keep going. <laughs> That's great. So what that measures is the uh, end tidal exhaled carbon dioxide. And uh, now you need to realize that you've got to have cardiac output for this to work. Woo, say again. Got to have cardiac <laughs> output for this to work. So I mean, if you put it on someone that's arrested, they're not delivering carbon dioxide to their lungs. They're not exhaling it. It's not going to be there. So got to have all all three pieces of the puzzle for it to come together. But that's really good. And, and uh, as far as knowing that you've intubated the right place, you know, back when I was with you, they just had these little colorometric turns yellow. That's you know, the breathing color. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yellow is the breathing color, right? <laughs> All right. Now it's all over here. These are a couple definitions. I don't know if you need to know this. Uh, PAT CO2 is partial pressure of end tidal CO2. PaCO2 is the amount of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood. That's what the A stands for. <laughs> Explain the difference because you know there's been some questions about the number differences. So a normal exhalation range would be from 35 to 45 milliliters of mercury versus the normal range in the arterial. Well, normal normal in the arterial is 40, mm -hmm. you know, so that's midway between the 35 to 45. So they just give you a range on the capnography, but but normal PCO2 in the lung in the in the arterial blood is 40. Okay, and so anything more than that will generate a respiratory acidosis because CO2 yeah. is an acid; it forms carbonic acid when it's when it reacts with water. And anything less than 40 is a respiratory alkalosis because you're removing acid from the system. And there used to be a big, ugly couple hour lecture on that. I don't know. They had it yesterday. Huh? They had it yesterday? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys ought to, ought to have it then. <laughs> All right, so, so CO2 returns from the tissues and it returns to the right atrium via the venous circulation to the right ventricle and it gets pumped out to the lungs where it gets exchanged for oxygen. It diffuses into the lungs and it's ventilated out and oxygen is inhaled and gets transferred into the circulation. Um, I was always trying to figure this out. You know, I, I guess they're talking about decreased CO2 and tidal levels here because most of these things, a cardiac arrest would cause increased CO2 at the tissue level. So if they're talking about end, end tidal, um, a pulmonary embolus will affect the blood flow to the lung. <laughs> I, I don't see how airway obstruction would cause a decreased CO2 level. I, I think that slide is wrong. Yeah. Uh, would you mind talking about uh, briefly, your use of arterial blood gases in reference to acid base balance in, in, the, in the emergency department. So oh, sure. Compensated versus partially compensated. Because we talked about that yesterday. We And truthfully, we're going to hit it again because I, I feel like that's a concept that we need to be very comfortable with. So, did you go through all of the math? The, the, like the golden rules and all that stuff? Not really. Okay. All right. Well, let me just give you an overview then. And this is. This is as I say, it's complicated stuff, but what I would do in my head when I'd get a blood gas back is I'd look at the pH and then I'd look at the CO2. And the, the first golden rule tells you that for every change of the CO2 by 10, that will account for a pH change of 0.08. Okay, so for example, if I get a, a pH of 7.32, then if the CO2 is 50, 
then that entire pH change of 0.08 is explained by the CO2 change of 10. Went from 40 to 50. If, on the other hand, I had that same patient and the pH was 7.40 and the PCO2 was 50, then there would have had to have been a metabolic alkalosis compensating for the respiratory acidosis that I could explain based on the CO2 change. So you need to know that a change of 10 CO2 units is equivalent to a pH change of 0.08. So if the CO2 goes up, the pH goes down. Okay. Then there are further calculations as to figuring out the amount of the metabolic alkalosis or acidosis so you can figure out how much bicarb to give. But as I say, that's a that's a subject for a whole other lecture unless you want me to take off into that. Matt. And you're using 40 as the PACO2. 40 is the P normal PACO2 from which you measure. And 7.40 is the normal arterial pH that you use to measure. Although technically there's a range of normal. Okay. I guess more of a, a generalization of the, the disease process is if you if you diagnose it as uncompensated, you know that you're still fairly towards the beginning of the treatment and it's it's towards the, the acute onset potentially all the way up to compensated to healthy. Um, and how that helps guide your clinical decision making in that regard. Okay. Um, Metabolic alkalosis, whether it's primary or secondary, is um, is a, a one to two day compensation process involving the kidney saving bicarb. Okay, so the kidney's not peeing it out, so you're saving bicarb, so you're building up bicarb to to mitigate against a respiratory acidosis usually. Primary metabolic alkalosis is very rare, and the body would do a lousy job of compensating because what would it have to do to, to compensate for a primary metabolic alkalosis? Sorry, breathe less or stop breathing. And I already told you what job one is. <laughs> Providing oxygen is job one. So. You know, and how do you get a primary metabolic alkalosis if you overdose on antacids or something stupid if you give five amps of bicarb to someone? You know, so you don't ever want to make someone alkalotic. There's a, there's another downside to, to being alkalotic. Anybody know what that is? This is a stretch. Oxygen is not released from the hemoglobin well unless there's acidosis acid milieu. So if you make someone alkalotic, the oxygen train comes to the tissues with the oxygen loaded onto the boxcars and it leaves the tissues with the oxygen loaded onto the boxcars. So you're causing tissue hypoxia if you make someone excessively alkalotic. So you don't want to overcorrect or even fully correct. Hmm. We usually half correct. All right. So what is that? Uh, is it because the CO2 doesn't displace the oxygen on the hemoglobin? Or? No. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And so the way that's put together is um, the, the creator wanted it to be so that the more need there is at the tissue level, the more oxygen would be delivered. So a needy tissue is an acidotic tissue, right? So the the, hem, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve shifts, I think it's called a shift to the left. So at a, at a certain level, more of the oxygen will dissociate in the face of acidosis. So basically, you're defeating one of nature's safeguards for providing more oxygen to hypoxic acidotic tissue. You know, the, the intent is not uh, to make the oxygen stay on the hemoglobin, the intent is usually the body is faced with acidotic challenges. Metabolism forms acids. 
CO2 is an acid. So the train <laughs> has to unload more in the face of an acid load. So it can unload the CO2. Unload the oxygen. Yeah, offload the oxygen and put the CO2 on. Yeah, the CO2 is going to be delivered in the bloodstream. I don't, I don't believe it goes onto the hemoglobin molecule. I think that it is passive, passively dissolved in, in the serum. So it has to do whether the oxygen is coming off the hemoglobin or whether it stays bound to the hemoglobin. The CO2 is passively diffusing into the serum. And I'm not aware that hemoglobin carries carbon dioxide. Okay, any more questions? And then, sir, I have a question about like if you have carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah. Maybe that's different carbon monoxide binding to. Carbon monoxide binds the like 200 times more with more affinity than oxygen. Okay. So what happens with carbon monoxide is it binds to the sites and it doesn't let go. So it displaces the ability of the hemoglobin to carry oxygen. So you still end up with oxygen starvation at the tissue level. And the treatment for that is high flow oxygen. Assuming you don't have hyperbaric chambers in your unit, which <laughs> you know, you know, but the, the half-life of carbon monoxide is something like two hours on room air. And the half-life on 100% oxygen is about 40 minutes. So you can substantially improve the clearing of carbon monoxide by giving 100% oxygen. And you should. Okay. We talked about all that. Talked about that. And I have a question about the high carb and the carb. Uh, yes. Was that the trail we said we didn't want to go down? Hmm? We said we didn't want to go down the high carb and uh, as far as how to calculate how much to give. Okay, then this doesn't do that at all. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that an excessive amount of high carb can't knock out respiratory drive in a patient, correct? Like the the way that you could fix a overly alkalitic state would be to stop breathing, correct? Yes. A, a, a compensation mechanism would be to slow that breathing down. That would cause a respiratory acidosis. So if we don't have a way in the field of obtaining an ABV and someone went down as a result of an excessive amount of alkalosis, one of our standing orders when we get on scene is it's, it's a prolonged downtime to give, I think it's, what is it, for 100 kilo patients, it's two amps of bicarb. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also talked a little bit about how bicarb interferes with the action of epinephrine yes. and cardiac arrest. Yes. It doesn't really, it seems like the risk of giving it outweighs the benefit of guessing whether or not it would help. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, you know, when, when I first trained in ACLS, they gave bicarb routinely, but they changed the, the, the recommendation, as I understand. I mean, isn't it now like a 2A two, two or a 2B or something? I don't know, it's just something else. Brandon, what's, uh, what's bicarb's uh, rating now? It's a 2B or? I believe it is 2B. Yeah, which is, which is maybe harmful or something like that. Now, in a prolonged arrest, your chances of being al alkalotic are not really. Right. You know, it's, they're gonna be acidotic. And so you're not going to overcorrect someone with two amps in a 100 kilo patient. Okay. Not gonna happen. And, and they typically reserve it for, Cole, do you know the, is it 15 minutes of downtime? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of protocols will reserve it for 15 to 20 minutes sometimes just because the because the blood gas is so acidic at that point. And so you in order to prevent deactivating the epinephrine, they wait until pretty much a last ditch Hail Mary pass effort. Well, let's put some bicarb and see if something works. Yeah. We used to have a saying for it. At that point, you're practicing what we call bucket chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's pretty much yeah, over sure. by the time you're pushing bicarb these right. days. It's actually called the kitchen sink protocol in our protocol book. Right. Yeah, that's. It's called the what? The kitchen sink protocol. Kitchen sink 
protocol. It's in our protocol book too. So it's fine. Dr. Ball has a good sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna, you're not going to hurt someone with two amps of bicarb, you know, yeah, especially standard, if they've been down for 15 minutes. Right. Yeah. The standard dose is one mil, one one mil equivalent per kilogram. Right. So or the max is 50. So that's not bad. Can you talk about how it affects ethers? Mm -hmm. They just competitively bind to the alpha and beta site, do they not? I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry, the rust is showing. <laughs> From what I understand is it's, it almost acts this in, as Narcan acts to an opioid, opioid overdose, how it kind of competitively binds for the site. To my knowledge, that it does a similar action to Epi. So. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Sorry. But I won't make something up if I don't know, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right, this is more about hand titles. We're not going to mess with that. Uh, and I'm actually going to do a lecture over the hand titles, so if you want to kind of slide through that. Yep, we're sliding. <laughs> All right, management. Okay, any any airway is priority. Any patient that's hypoxic gets oxygen. If they fail to breathe, you breathe for them. That's it. Um, oh no, that's fine. Good. I bet you think everybody's eyes are swelling right now. Fresh coffee going too. Sorry, I'll talk forever. No, no, don't be sorry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>